Hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, zooming to all of you from Johannesburg, South Africa. We are bracing ourselves for an approaching cold front, so I hope that wherever you find yourselves, you are keeping warm and safe. Now tonight, we enjoy the second episode in our three-part series on biodiversity stewardship and look forward to hearing about the exciting site-based conservation work taking place within the grasslands and wetlands of South Africa. But before we begin tonight's webinar, please remember that you, our audience, can communicate with us using the Zoom chat room and questions for our speakers can be posted into the Q&A box throughout the webinar. If you are tuning into us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions, and we'll be sure to answer these at the end of the webinar. You can use the hashtag conservation conversations to get in touch with us on social media. All of our previous episodes are available on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel, as well as on our podcast. Now, a big thanks to everyone who has already subscribed to our YouTube channel. We are just a mere 50 subscribers away from hitting the 1000 subscribers mark. So please help us cross that threshold. All you have to do is click subscribe on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel, and we will be able to cross that threshold together. If you're enjoying the series and can afford to support it financially, every little bit helps us to keep this webinar free for all to learn and enjoy. Simply scan the quicker QR code on screen or visit our Conservation Conversations website to find the link to the donations tab. A big thank you to everyone who has donated so far. Now we're just 10 days away from the start of our second virtual African bird fair, which is taking place on 30 and 31 July, 2021. And those of you who tuned in a little bit earlier will have caught Andrew de Bloch giving a sneak preview into the amazing platform that Participate have built for us. You can book your spot at our incredible lineup of speakers and workshops, which includes Chris Packham, the UK-based conservation television presenter, and David Lindo, the urban birder. Visit eventmobi.com slash birdfair to register or the BirdLife South Africa website, which has been posted into the chat feed on Zoom. And you can also hear sentiments directly from one of our presenters' mouths. I'm gonna welcome Science and Innovation Program Manager, Dr. Alan Lee, to share with you why he thinks you should be at the Virtual African Bird Fair. Hi, I'm Alan Lee. Somewhere up here is a Cape Rock jumper. You can't see it because they are masters of hide and seek. They are the best to hide and seek. In fact, they're the best at everything. They are the best birds. They're your favorite birds. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, come see my talk, the Virtual Bird Fair, hosted by BirdLife South Africa, end of July. It's a talk that will leave you dazed and confused, or vaguely amused. See you there. Thank you for that, Alan Lee. It is great to have you on the team, and we really are looking forward to your Bird of the Year talk at the Virtual African Bird Fair. I also see that our BirdLife South Africa honorary patron, Pamela Isdell, is tuned in and it's wonderful to have you with us, Pamela. And we wish you all of the best with your recovery. And it now gives me great pleasure to welcome my two incredible teammates who work tirelessly in the Landscape Conservation Program at BirdLife South Africa to ensure that our threatened grassland and wetland birds, in particular, the critically endangered white-winged fluff-tail, are safeguarded in the most pristine sites. A big welcome to Karina Pinar, the Angula and Grasslands Project Manager, and Dr. Carl Lloyd, the Rock Jumper White Wing Flufftail Fellow of Conservation. We are immensely grateful to our major funders of this important conservation work, in particular, the Angula Partnership in ESCOM, Rock Jumper Birding Tours, and BirdLife International. Karina is based out of Miamal in the Eastern Free State and spends much of her time fulfilling duties linked to the Angula Partnership and conservation of the surrounding Snewberg and Upper Volcha protected environments. Karina holds an MSc in environmental science from the Northwest University. And before joining BirdLife South Africa in 2017, Karina held an internship with the NRF hosted by the Center for Environmental Management at the University of the Free State. Karina is passionate about grasslands and ensuring that the management of these productive ecosystems is carried out in ways that benefit both the birds and communities who rely on them. Karina also manages the Southern Bald Ibis Conservation Project and coordinates volunteer monitors across the country each spring to monitor how these birds are doing. 
If you trek the grasslands northwards along the Drakensberg escarpment, you will reach the beautiful town of Delstrom, which is where our resident flufftail expert, Dr. Carl Lloyd, calls home. Before joining BirdLife South Africa in April of 2020, Carl completed his PhD in zoology, specifically focusing on the population ecology of marine mammals on Marion Island. Carl spends much of his time working to identify, monitor, and safeguard the most critical wetlands for the white-winged flufftail across South Africa and the broader African continent. And as an avid bird ringer, Carl is trying to find ways in which we can begin to answer questions linked to this elusive bird's genetics and ecology. Carl is fast becoming an expert in wetland ecology and is actively involved in assisting landowners with improved management of these important ecosystems to maintain healthy ecosystem services for both people and the white-winged flufftail. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight for this second episode in our biodiversity stewardship and landscape conservation series. I'm gonna give you both a chance to say hello to everyone before we begin the presentation. So we'll start with Karina and then hand over to Carl. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our presentation, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Oh, hello, everyone, and yeah, welcome. Yeah, it should be a, a, a good one. Fantastic. Thank you both. We'll head into your presentation, and we will take questions at the end. Enjoy, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our conservation conversations tonight. I am Karina Pinar, BirdLife South Africa's Angula and Grasslands Conservation Project Manager. And tonight we will be introducing you to BirdLife's Biodiversity Stewardship Projects in the High Altitude Grasslands and Wetlands of South Africa. So just a quick background on what biodiversity stewardship is. It, it's basically um, a way for private landowners to become involved in conservation through becoming a custodian of their properties, using it wisely so that the natural environment is protected. We cannot depend on national parks alone to adequately protect our ecosystems. And so we really need the help of private landowners to, to fulfill that role. And therefore, through biodiversity stewardship, we have four levels of protection, each requiring a devil, different level of commitment from the landowner. At the top of, um, or, or at the highest level, we have a nature reserve, uh, which requires the highest level of commitments from the landowner, has quite a lot of restrictions on the landowner as well, um, but it provides the, the most protection um, just below National Park as, um, to the landowner as well. Um, just below that, and the one that we work with most frequently, is a protected environment. A protected environment has a little less protection, but it also has less regulations to the landowner, um, allowing, for example, agricultural activities to continue while protecting the environment. Just to clarify that through no way is biodiversity stewardship a way for government to take ownership of these prop properties. Um, there's only a, an agreement between the current landowner, the private landowner and the government um, agreeing that the landowner will manage it according to some basic uh, conservation principles, including um, alien invasive plant clearing or uh, fixing erosion points. So the grasslands and wetlands in South Africa are some of the least protected environments uh, we have, or least protected ecosystems, with only 16% of grasslands being somewhat adequately protected. Um, so that leaves 84% of our grasslands under severe threat. And some of the threats include um, bad agricultural practices, mining and other developments, leaving a highly fragmented uh, ecosystem for biodiversity to use. And this is really upsetting if you take into account that grasslands can provide very important mitigation 
to some of the challenges that we face in the world today. One of which is um, the problem we have with carbon release into the atmosphere. Just to quickly explain, factories like, for example, um, power stations often release, or not often, they do release carbon into the atmosphere. And the only way to take that carbon out of the atmosphere is through plants. Um, everyone usually jumps to rainforests and the role that grasslands play in um, taking this carbon out of the atmosphere is often um, completely underestimated. Plants absorb the carbon, use it for photosynthesis and um, give us oxygen, but they also store a lot of that carbon through their roots into the soil. The second way is for decaying organisms to put that carbon back into the soil. And we don't want a lot of dead organisms lying around, animals, etc. So the easiest way is through plants. Grasslands can store up to 30% of the world's organic carbon. And Prof Ed Bork, a rangeland ecologist from the University of Alberta in the USA, said that temperate grasslands, similar to the ones we have in South Africa as well, can store more than 300 gigatons of carbon. Nine gigatons are basically in the plants, while the majority is below ground in the soil. To put that in perspective, each megawatt hour of electricity from coal power plants produce less than one ton of carbon. So other than carbon sequestration in the grasslands, water is a second benefit that it provides to the environment. When rainwater falls, a well-managed grassland or wetland system will assist with the water infiltration into the soil, uh, rather than letting a quick thunderstorm and the water that comes along with it run off into the nearest stream or river and causing floods. Through absorbing or infiltration of that water into the soil, it can be released in a sustainable um, rate over a lengthy, a certain length of time. Um, it's also filtered and the quick runoff on the surface um, can also, if in a poorly managed grassland, can, leave, can lead to erosion. Uh, so a well-managed grassland absorbs the water, make it sustainably available to the local community and their livestock, but it also um, prevents erosion in that area. The most important reason for us, well, not most important, but a very important reason for us, as water is quite important, is that it's the home of threatened species in South Africa. And this includes some of the, um, some of the antelope species like Oribe, mountain reedbuck and grey reedbuck. Uh, there are sun gazers in, in South Africa's grasslands, which are um, only found in these areas. And then from BirdLife South Africa's perspective, you have more than 20 threatened species occurring in the grasslands alone. Some of them are um, endemic to South Africa and our grasslands specifically. That includes the southern bald ibis, Rudd's lark, Buta's lark and yellow-breasted pipit. Um, and some are more, more wide-ranged, um, such as the corans, the bustards, uh, secretary birds. And then, of course, in our wetlands, we have all of our crane species and, most importantly, the critically endangered white-winged flufftail. So this is the reason why grasslands are a priority area for BirdLife South Africa. And we work in primarily two regions, all situated in the Music Highfeld grassland. Um, that is the Eastern Free State up to the Mpumalanga border. That's where I work. 
and then Dr. Carl Lloyd, who will explain to you a little later where he's working and what he's doing, works in the Dahlstrom and Southern KZN regions. And it all started um, about 20 years ago, that's when we first became involved in grassland work with the Ingula Pump Storage Scheme, which has now been declared the Ingula Nature Reserve in 2018. And subsequently, just at the beginning of this year, it was also designated as South Africa's 27th wetland of international importance, according to the Ramsar Convention. So it's a highly important site internationally, and it all started through the Ingula Partnership, which is a partnership between ESCOM, Middlepint Wetland Trust, and BirdLife South Africa around the Ingula Pump Storage Scheme on the Eastern Free State KwaZulu-Natal boundary. And they've declared it a nature reserve about the size of, yeah, about 8,000 hectares in size. Of that 8,000 hectare, hectares, uh, 1,200 hectares are wetlands. And um, the rest is com composed of grasslands and forests, indigenous yellowwood forests. Since the project began 20 years ago, we have recorded 342 bird species just on this 8,000 hectares, including 25 regionally threatened species and four regionally critically endangered birds. That includes the white-winged flufftail, wattled crane, white-backed vulture, and bearded vultures. So our activities on the Angula Nature Reserve is mainly focused on birds, um, monitoring their diversity through monthly counts, making sure that there's nothing threatening our um, bird diversity. We have 13 priority threatened species that breed on the Nature Reserve that we also monitor on an annual basis through their own uh, breeding seasons. And then we have uh, uh, mortality surveys through uh, roadkill, recording all the, the birds and mammals and reptiles that are killed in, in road related incidents. And we have uh, quarterly surveys of all the power lines in the nature reserve. These power lines uh, or power line surveys are done through walking underneath these power lines, uh, recording all bird carcasses of birds that have collided with the structures, infrastructure, and um, submitting this information to both ESCOM and the EWT's uh, wildlife and energy program, so that the, the proper mit mitigation of these infrastructure or this infrastructure can occur. Um, we also conduct research on the nature reserve and the research is not only bird-based. We have done small mammal um, research projects. Uh, yes, with a bird influence because we wanted to see what prey base they were for the, for the raptors and other um, research projects. Research is ongoing and it provides our um, very important information into habitat management and our what's happening with our species. All of this then feeds back into uh, environmental education. We've got projects with the surrounding communities and with the farmers um, that we have to take all of this knowledge and share with them the importance of our grasslands, wetlands and biodiversity. And if every person who visits Ingula as a tourist for tourist for, for birding purposes or watching butterflies or just enjoying the scenery um, will get a part of this environmental awareness or education as well. So it all feeds back into one another. If you want more information about Ingula, I'm not going to go into too much right now because we've done a whole Conservation Conversations webinar previously. If you YouTube Conservation Conversations in Gula, you will find it quite quickly and you can get more information on the partnership. 
If you are interested in visiting Ingula Nature Reserve, please don't hesitate to contact me. I will gladly assist you with that. So surrounding the Ingula Nature Reserve, and as one of the activities for, uh, by the Angula Partnership, we realized that a larger area was needed for especially our large species like secretary birds and cranes. So we've uh, started the project of declaring the Upper Vilge protected environment. The declaration is currently in progress um, and it's about 24,000 hectares over 20 landowners big. Um, one of the most prominent features in the area, and one that you will definitely see as you drive from Van Ruinen to Ingula, is the Nelson Skop Mountain and the associated uh, Cape Vulture Colony that roost on this mountain. And it currently has up to 200 Cape Vultures roosting there. So other than that, we have several reasons for declaring the Upper Vilge protected environment. That includes, most importantly, the value that, the, uh, that it provides to our water resources in South Africa. The whole area um, surrounding or in the Upper Vilge protected environment is part of South Africa's strategic water source areas. So what a strategic water source area is, is that it's basically a small, relatively small surface area that has a disproportionately large contribution to our water resources. That can either be through surface runoff in streams or something like that, or it can be through groundwater recharge through wetlands. And we have abundant sources of both wetlands and streams in the upper Vilge protected environment. This is one of the strategic water source areas in South, uh, um, in South Africa that provides up to 69% of Gauteng's water resources. So if you had a cup of coffee this morning using filtered water, the chances are pretty good that some of your water may have come from the Upper Vilge protected environment. Second to that is the biodiversity value. As I've gone through the important species in the upper or in the grasslands, most of them occur in the Upper Volga area as well. The farmers will often tell you about all the cranes that they have on their farms. And this is especially an important site for uh, the whole of the Eastern Free State for Southern Bold Ibis and Yellow-Breasted Pippet. The third reason is that it's a functional buffer zone around the Ingula Nature Reserve. Expanding the, the footprint of the Nature Reserve um, and increasing the, the well-protected grasslands and wetlands for biodiversity. We also have several sun, sun gazer um, uh, colonies, if I can call it a colony, in the Upper Vilge protected environment. Um, so this is also a very important species for especially the Endangered Wildlife Trust, and we are collaborating with them in the Upper Vilge PE to get this declared as a, a protected area. And then the fifth reason is very um, technical. In 2016, South Africa published the National Protected Area Expansion Strategy. And one of the areas that they highlighted that is a priority for them to um, increase their protected areas in is this Eastern Free State area. So this is just a technical point, but it's very important as um, the protected area expansion strategy will assist us in reaching our um, protection targets for all our East uh, ecosystems in South Africa. Just about 
50 kilometers north of the Upper Vilge protected environment, surrounding the little town of Miemel. We also have this Newburgh protected environment. Declared in 2017, approximately 17,400 hectares, and we've recorded more than 200 bird species just on these properties. Which is why one of the most important reasons for declaring this new bird protected environment is the biodiversity value. Uh, this is one of the few sites where in South Africa where Rudd's lark is still doing okay. Um, Yellow-breasted puppet is, is quite happy in this area and we also have uh, so, uh, southern bald ibis colonies, quite a lot of them, and a couple of wattled crane breeding pairs. So from a threatened species perspective, we have a lot happening in this new bird protected environment, all the while providing a buffer zone for the Sequoia Flay Nature Reserve, which is one of our um, most magnificent wetland nature reserves in South Africa, if I, if I can say so. Um, and then a little bit to the, to the northwest of that, uh, we have just above Freda, between Freda and Carolina, mm -hmm. we have a proposed Chidelo nature reserve, which is currently in progress, of about 1,200 hectares. And the reason the landowner contacted us to try and declare this protect, this nature reserve is because of a large multi-species breeding cliff, uh, including several southern bald ibis nests. Um, some of the other cliffs or species breeding on this cliff um, include spoonbill, um, both types of, well, black-headed and grey heron, sacred ibis, and then your small um, swifts swallows and, or not swifts necessarily, swifts, ugh, swallows and martins. Um, so it's quite a spectacular spot. They also have otters, etc. So definitely a, a worthy nature reserve. But since we've just started with the process at the beginning of the year, there's really not much else I can tell you about this at the moment. So for all of these sites, these are the four sites that I work in specifically. For all of them, we provide post-declaration support. This comes in ways of uh, development and review of their management plans, uh, making sure that they do adhere to the, the regulations set for them. Um, and part of the management plan activities is the development of an annual plan of operation. This is where the the landowners or the landowners associations um, come together and they say that this year we want to, for example, remove X amount of hectares of alien plants. And at the end of that year, um, we review that annual plan of operation to see whether they have reached their targets. We also facilitate annual general meetings with the landowners associations. And all of this is is done through frequent landowners, landowner engagements. Um, we constantly talk to, to our landowners, making sure that they are all aware of what's happening, what's required of them, and how we can assist in any way. We are currently also busy with a phase two in this new bird protected environment. Uh, we are busy um, planning for that, and we'll start engaging with interested landowners soon. Phase two entails uh, or is aimed at expanding the surface area of this protected environment. And then we are also assisting as the middleman with the declaration in the Upper Vilge PE. So we are um, engaging both with the landowners, keeping them up to date with what's happening, but assisting the provincial government um, as well with their duties. And through all this landowner engagements, we also monitor as we're driving through the area. We monitor the habitat through remote sensing and on the ground initiatives. Um, we, of course, monitor our bird populations. So that's a general presence and diversity through 
atlasing for the Southern African Bird Atlas Project, or SABAP2. Um, we also uh, monitor our threatened species breeding, um, including the roosting colony, roosting vulture colony. And then when there's a power line collision, our landowners immediately let us know. We investigate with ESCOM and the EWT Wildlife and Energy Program and make sure that the lines are adequately mitigated. And then we have a couple of overarching grassland projects that we work with. Um, this includes research that we are currently busy with into grassland management practices, um, increasing carbon sequestration to the point that we possibly can. Uh, we're looking into regenerative agricultural uh, practices, etc. And all of this research gets put back into our bird-friendly birding and grazing best practice guidelines for grasslands, um, which is available on our website. Um, we also use this research to feed into specific species action plans. We've developed um, Angula Nature Reserve uh, species action plans for yellow-breasted pipit and wattle crane. And then we've got a national species action plan for southern bald ibis. Um, and we use all of this grassland management research to feed into these documents. Uh, the Science and Innovation Program from BirdLife uh, is, has set up this habitat suitability models or developed these habitat suitability models. And although we are not um, involved in developing these models, we assist them through ground truthing of these models. So as you can see on the um, map on your screen, that's the Southern Bold Ibis distribution through our area or suitable habitat for them. And um, we'll, you can see that the whole of the Eastern Free State is quite an important area for Southern Bold Ibis. As I mentioned, we also Atlas for SABAP2 and for that, or to, towards that purpose, we've also um, created the Free State KwaZulu-Natal Escarpment sub-project on SABAP2. For the atlases out there, you'll know what this is all about. And we are currently trying to get all of the, uh, or this whole area um, green. So with around four to 10 um, cards per pentad. And um, after that, we will continue on to blue. We are almost at our green target and we'll, we'll be moving on shortly. Um, but this is a way for you to get involved in the grassland projects that we have. As you're driving down from Gauteng, Gauteng to, um, to the sea, down to the KZN or to the mountains, um, it's a really short pop off, do an atlas card and go on your holiday. Um, and then finally, we also have av avitourism development as an overarching grassland project. We are currently busy um, with guide training of eight grassland specific guides. And um, they will be fully trained and registered by the end of this year. And with them in mind as well, we will be developing a birding route throughout the whole of the Eastern Free State. Um, we are currently busy developing a, another guide to bird watching, similar to the one that was published for Memel, which is available on the website, um, but for the Upper Vilge Protected Environment as well. So these two should link up and create a birding route, a really nice area for you to visit over a couple of days in the Eastern Free State and you should tick all of your um, special uh, grassland species on this. So on that note, I'm, looking really, I'm really looking forward to see you in the Eastern Free State soon. 
Um, if you are interested in visiting the Ingula Nature Reserve, please note that prior arrangement is necessary. Give me about a week's notice if you are planning to come down. Um, it is an active or op um, power station that is in operation. So we do have to arrange access permits for you. But it's really easy. So please just send me an email prior to your arrival and we will get you sorted out. Really looking forward to seeing you here. And I will now hand over to Dr. Kyle Lloyd, who will explain to you where he's working. Thank you, Karina. I'm gonna start us off by talking about habitats within the grassland biome. So while the majority of the landscape may consist of grassland, within this biome, there are unique habitats such as wetlands, rivers, forests, and rocky outcrops. Each of these habitats have their own ecosystem processes that maintain habitat structure and functionality. Major threats to these habitats are habitat destruction, which is quite self-explanatory, but a more subtle threat is mismanagement. So often landowners do not adjust their burning and fire regimes to accommodate the unique ecosystem processes that maintain these different habitat types. The majority of my work focuses on wetlands and I'll be talking about wetland stewardship for the remainder of this talk. So what is an inland wetland? There are various definitions, but according to our National Water Act, it is a transitional zone between terrestrial and aquatic systems where the water table is at or near the surface with vegetation adapted to saturated soil conditions. So if we have a look at this diagram on the top, we can see that as we move from the outside to the center of a wetland, we experience a water gradient. And along this gradient, there are different vegetation communities associated with these different zones. This water gradient will also fluctuate with seasonal rainfall patterns. We can also classify wetlands according to the hydrogeomorphology of the wetland. So this is how the hydrology of the wetland interacts with its landscape. For example, we have seeps, which occur often at high altitudes on steep gradients. This then flows down the catchment into channeled and unchanneled valley bottoms. Further down the catchment where the rivers start to meander, we have floodplain wetlands and wetland flats. And interspersed throughout, we can also have depressions. The National Biodiversity Assessment in 2018 identified inland wetlands along with estuaries as the most unprotected and threatened ecosystem type in South Africa. And so wetlands certainly warrant stewardship. Wetlands may be threatened and unprotected, but why should we conserve them? What value do they add to society? While wetlands provide a host of ecosystem services through regulating and supporting services, provisioning services, and cultural services, these are provided to both local communities and international communities through things like carbon storage. Some of the most important ecosystem services that wetlands have to offer is through the regulation of water flowing through a catchment. Wetlands intercept this water and slowly release the supply to downstream users. In the process, the water is also purified and the impact of flooding events are minimized. Most of my work involves trying to conserve and research the white wing flufftail. And for those who are not familiar with the species, it is classified as critically endangered, meaning that it is one step away from becoming extinct in the wild. The white wing flufftail is very special in that it is a habitat specialist preferring intact, healthy wetlands. And so the presence of this flufftail indicates that we have a functioning wetland system. If you have the fortune of seeing the white wing flufftail, all you will get is a glimpse of these white secondaries as it flies over um, the wetlands. White wing flufftails breed in high altitude wetlands in South Africa and Ethiopia. And we study this highly elusive bird using passive monitoring equipment, such as acoustic devices and camera traps. If you'd like to find out more about the species, and the research involved, you can visit a previous Conservation Conversations webinar that has been published on YouTube.
So the white-winged flufftail acts as a flagship species or ambassador of water and wetland conservation. By conserving the white-winged flufftail, we are also conserving wetland habitat. And through the white-winged flufftail project, other aspects of wetland conservation have been initiated, such as wetland management, wetland rehabilitation, wetland protection, and wetland awareness through things such as the Flufftail Festival. I'll be talking about these different facets of wetland conservation and how the White Wing Flufftail Project has initiated these. So our first stop is the Greater Lark and Flay Protected Environment or the GLPE. The GLPE is located between Belfast and Dalstrom in Mpumalanga province and is situated on the Steenkampsberg Plateau, which is part of the Drakensberg mountain range. This protected environment came about due to the increasing threat of mining along the escarpment. And its main purpose is to protect uh, important river sources. So the Olifants and Crocodile River catchments, part of that catchment starts here in, um, in the GLPE, as well as protecting an extensive wetland system called Lark and Flay. So the protected environment was proclaimed in 2017 by several uh, conservation bodies, and it protects 14,000 hectares. And this consists of um, wetlands, rolling grasslands, and rocky outcrops. I really encourage you to come and have a visit. There's lots of activities, especially fly fishing. Within the GLP, there's also the Landowners Association Committee. And this committee consists of a chairman, secretary, and various representatives of, of different stakeholder groups. The committee has been successful in, an, in opposing inappropriate developments within and around the GLP, erecting signboards, and now more recently, the expansion of the protected environment. Future objectives include improving the present ecological state of the, of the GLP, developing ecotourism and through that job creation, and addressing the deteriorating road conditions. So how do we as BirdLife South Africa assist the Greater Lark and Flay Protected Environment? Firstly, we have a fantastic team of environmental lawyers at BirdLife South Africa, Dr. Melissa Lewis and Lindsay Smith, who through the policy, policy and advocacy program receive proposals for developments inside and outside the GLPE. They then engage with stakeholders to find a solution and where necessary, comment on these developments through the public participation process. I myself have been involved with the recent expansion of the GLPE along with Endangered Wildlife Trust. And this has involved meeting with new landowners to talk about the protected environment, its benefits, conduct site assessments and landowner interviews. And you can see from this map, the green areas are, is what has already been established as the GLP, and the blue areas are landowners who wish to join the protected environment. So we're really trying to expand the protection status for wetlands and have a more consolidated protected environment. Through the research that we conduct on the white wing fluff tail, we also improve our understanding of how wetlands function and we can translate those results into habitat guidelines. We can then make these guidelines available to landowners so that they can better manage their wetlands that in such a way that it encourages or improves biodiversity. We're also working with the local uh, birding club, the Scarpment Bird Club, by trying to develop avitourism in the area. Dalstrom and its surroundings, including the GLPE, is a really unappreciated birding destination. There are many endemic and threatened bird species to see. So we are trying to develop local birding routes, signage, and information resources for visitors, such as maps, checklists, and other brochures. This project is meant to try and uh, create awareness, establish uh, an appreciation for birds and their habitats, and create a, a source of revenue for landowners of the protected environment. This project, however, does require funding. So if you are interested in trying to support this project, please consider contacting me. There are many marketing opportunities for funders. Another very important site within the GLPE is Middlepint Wetland. And if you are not familiar with this 
very important wetland. It is the only confirmed breeding site of the white-winged flufftail in the southern hemisphere. So this record was made in 2018 and chicks were captured on the camera trap following their mother. And there are also pictures of juveniles that have been captured on these motion detected camera traps. And so it's really important that we safeguard this site for many years to come. And the nature reserve status allows for this. So we are very grateful to the landowners of uh, Dalstrom Trout Farm and Irlands Valley Farm who are wanting to establish this nature reserve. Our last site is in Sikeni Nature Reserve. So we are going to now travel to southern KwaZulu-Natal province at the foothills of the Drakensberg. So in Sikeni Nature Reserve is located between Underberg and Kokstadt. And at this reserve, you will find a beautiful landscape of mountains, grasslands, and a very big wetland system. And as you can imagine, this wetland is also very important for the white-winged flufftail with the recent records of the bird um, being present at this wetland. You can see from this map that the majority of the reserve consists of uh, a vast wetland system called Insekeni Flay, which protects the water that exits this reserve and supplies water to the surrounding communities, as well as commercial farmers on the sides. However, Insekeni is not without its challenges. So there are many issues that, that both the reserve managers and the community face. For example, there is a community run lodge and unfortunately that community lodge does not have the resources to maintain and service the structures. There's also extensive soil erosion throughout the reserve. And so all of this soil erodes and washes into the wetland, smothering sedge meadows that are used by white wing flufftail. Reserve infrastructure is also lacking, so fences are not repaired correctly. And there's also very limited signage. So there's literally one signboard directing you to the reserve if you come from Franklin side. Black wattle is also uh, invading the site. It's choking uh, the river's system. And this reduces water that is entering into the wetland and also changes soil and water chemistry. Livestock from the community are also making their way into the reserve, and this is encouraging things like soil erosion. So at BirdLife South Africa, we really want to try and establish a community project at Insekini Nature Reserve in the hope that this will be a self-sustaining system. Not only will it uh, improve the quality of life of individuals, but through creating these jobs, we'll also rehabilitate the site. By rehabilitating the site, we increase biodiversity. And by having increased biodiversity, we are then starting to restore and even improve ecosystem services that are delivered by the reserve. And the idea is that people then start to um, generate more revenue from these ecosystem services that are being delivered through things like ecotourism. The various projects that we as BirdLife South Africa have developed can be divided into ecotourism development, habitat restoration, and reserve infrastructure. Phase one of this community project will be ecotourism development, which includes things like establishing a website, a booking service uh, through that website, and other information resources, developing hiking trails, identifying notable cultural sites, and uh, establishing signboards. Again, this is a project which requires funding. So if you are interested, please consider contacting me. Uh, you can find my, ben, uh, my details below. Uh, so you can contact me by email. We've also prepared a video for you to tell you more about the Insekeni community project. If there are lags that you're experiencing, you can watch the video in your own time on YouTube. We'll put the link uh, in the comments below. So thank you very much for listening to us. And I hope that our presentations have just shown you uh, what biodiversity stewardship is all about and why it is important for conservation. Thank you.
Wildlife South Africa is hoping to work with the community that surrounds Insekeni Nature Reserve in southern KwaZulu-Natal province. At Insekeni Nature Reserve there is a vast wetland system that is inhabited by the critically endangered white-winged flufftail. The white-winged flufftail is listed under the African Eurasian Migratory Waterbird Agreement as a bird that needs special attention to prevent it from going extinct in the wild. We need to work with the community that surrounds Insekeni Nature Reserve to rehabilitate and restore the processes that maintain the wetland habitat that is used by the critically endangered white-winged flufftail. But more importantly, we need to conserve the ecosystem services that people derive from the wetland itself. The Lysen Forum has uh, defined objectives. Uh, one, to make sure that the nature that we have here at Nsigen Nature Reserve is uh, continuously conserved and it benefits the community and also our behavior reflects uh, that we have enormous understanding of nature. So that is our objective, to make sure that we serve the interest of the entire community as the beneficiaries in the nature reserve. If we can uh, prioritize on the issues of projects around here. Not projects precisely to benefit community only, but the projects that will reflect the benefit of nature conservation also. Just because we have uh, this wetland, we need this wetland to continue to be on the status that it, ha it has right now. We also engage the NGOs, the department, and us as the community fruitfully. I should think that one can take us furthermore. Some of the potential projects at Insekeni Nature Reserve include the removal of invasive black wattle, rehabilitating erosion gullies, developing ecotourism, and renovating the community lodge. Thank you, Carl and Karina. That was a fantastic overview about the incredible stewardship work being done in our grasslands and our wetlands. So if both of you would join me on screen, there we go. Thank you both. Uh, before we dive into questions, I see we've got a couple coming through here now. Um, just a reminder to everybody that as you exit the chat or the, the Zoom webinar tonight, you will get a link to the post webinar survey. If you wouldn't mind filling that in for us, please, there's a handful of questions. It'll take you two minutes just to give us some feedback. And one last reminder to please head on over to the BirdLife South Africa website and register for our virtual African bird fair taking place on the 30th and 31st of July. Next week is the final talk in our stewardship series. It's going to be given by Dr. Giselle Murison and Nicolette Forbes, and it's going to be all about the conservation of South Africa's estuaries and safeguarding these critical systems along our coastlines. So be sure to tune in next week, Tuesday at seven o'clock. It's definitely going to be an interesting one. But let's dive into some questions. And we're going to kick off, I see, with one that's not actually about our talk tonight, but uh, just to remind everybody that when you subscribe to our YouTube channel, when BirdLife South Africa crosses that thousand threshold, 
we will be able to start deriving an income from our video viewership. So do your part for conservation and subscribe to BirdLife's YouTube channel and Wilford Reynolds. That is why we need to get everybody to please click and subscribe. It will help us raise a bit of funding through these YouTube webinars. But I'm going to give this one over to uh, Karina. And this is linked to the carbon sequestration projects you were talking about. And this one's from Alistair Stalker. And he's asked whether we've registered any of these areas as part of any uh, carbon sequestration projects. And are there any baseline assessments being done yet in your areas? So if you wouldn't mind answering that, please, Karina. Thanks, Melissa. And thank you for, for the question, Alistair. Um, so we are just starting with our carbon se sequestration projects. Um, we are busy signing up landowners um, or will start soon. Um, so we haven't done any baseline studies yet, but we are starting with this project right now. Yeah, new, new and exciting, and we're certainly very excited to be partnering with We Act, and we look forward to the incredible work being done. If you are interested in carbon sequestration levels in the grasslands, as Kevin and Steve mentioned last week, there has been a lot of research done by Conservation South Africa in the grasslands of the Eastern Cape. So if you would like any information around those projects, please do visit the Conservation South Africa website. Now we've got a question here from Janet Proudfoot and she's asking who looks after the Buckestrum wetland, which has met many of these endangered species. So Carl, if you wouldn't mind sharing who's present at the Buckestrum wetland and what's going on there, please. Yeah, so we, if you're not aware, we have a bird life center there that's uh, run and managed by Christy Garland. Um, and yeah, so there's also a heritage society that looks after the wetland as well as uh, the provincial governing body. So in Pumalanga Tourism and Parks Agency. And there's various projects happening there. Some of my work with the white wing fluff tail also takes me there to do surveys and start building relationships with the landowners uh, where we find white wing fluff tail. Yeah. Brilliant, thanks Carl. And I see we've got a question here asking what the biggest threats to wetlands are from Pamela. So Carl, if you wouldn't mind uh, just talking around the biggest threats and particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, she is referring to. Mm, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's very much is the mismanagement of wetlands. Uh, so as I highlighted in my talk, um, yeah, wetlands have their own unique drivers in terms of fire and grazing. And I think often they're seen as the surrounding felt. And so that, you know, wetlands experiencing intense dry winter fires um, are really left exposed, that sensitive peat layer. So that's an, a partially decomposed organic layer um, that helps to filter the water. Um, that is left exposed for long periods of time until the rain that falls the following summer. Um, so it's, uh, as well as the fire could also start burning down into that peat layer. So, um, yeah, it's definitely the mismanagement, I think. Um, and that's why we need to develop best practice guidelines to, to help, um, to help people really understand the complexities of these, of these wetland systems. There's so many drivers in the landscape that are maintaining the, these habitats. Absolutely, and that peat layer is also very important when it comes to storing carbon, so we don't want to see that going up in smoke and, and doing all that good sequestration work. Uh, Karina, I'm going to send the next one your way, and this is from Dr. Llewellyn Taylor, and he's asking whether the University of Free State, one of your former employers, I believe, is involved in any of the work or research being done by BirdLife South Africa in the region. And uh, if you would add to that, Carl, once Karina's done, please. Um, no, not on my side. I am not aware of any, yeah, for, for me specifically, I'm not working with any of the Free State um, University's researchers currently. Um, I have had requests in the past, but thus far nothing has been able to um, to been finalized. So yeah, unfortunately not at the moment, although we are not opposed to it. Awesome. Carl, anything from your side? 
Yeah, so we have a very good collaboration with the Afro Montaigne Research Unit housed at the University of Free State, and that's uh, headed by Dr. Ralph Clark. Yeah, and so we're really looking at the bioacoustics of, of the wetland monitoring um, because it's a device that records the entire soundscape. We can start looking at questions not only about the white wing fluff tail, but about the community as well. So you know, other aspects like the mammals, the insects, the amphibians, and other birds as well. And these community level questions really help us to then start getting a better insight into our wetlands and how they function, the diversity along a gradient, the diversity in a protected environment versus outside. Um, so yeah, we're really hoping that through that collaboration, we can again produce top quality research that can then feed into those best practice guidelines for wetland management. Definitely. Thanks, Carl. And it really makes such a difference for us to be able to partner with academic institutions and researchers at the top of their game. It, it definitely helps inform all of the conservation actions that we're taking on the ground. So we're very grateful to the many institutions that we do partner with, particularly the Afro-Montane Research Unit at University of Free State. Now, Karina, I'm going to send this next one your way. This one's from Ryle Loon, and he's asking, is there a framework which can quantify the economic benefits to our biodiversity stewards, meaning the landowners, and how are these distributed and who decides where all of these different benefits go? Okay, that's a, that's a bit more in-depth, but... Um, yeah, to start off, there is a, um, Sanby did publish the business case for biodiversity stewardship, which is a four page um, document that you can go and have a look at if you are interested in this further. But specifically for the, um, for the farmers, it's basically returning the ecological, um, the research into the ecological services that the grasslands and the wetlands provide to them. Um, that they can achieve through becoming a steward. There's no um, specific direct economic benefit to them at, other than, um, than the ecological services that they gain from this. Um, for nature reserve, there is a, a tax benefit that can be deducted. And as far as I know, the one for protected environments, although being a little more complicated, is still in, in its uh, development phase. So there is a kind of um, return to the landowners in that way for especially nature reserves that they can go into. Um, your second part of the question, how are these economic benefits distributed and who decides uh, where the, these benefits go. That's a little more um, difficult to determine. As some of the ecological services that the, um, the proper management of this grassland and wetland provide is things like water. Uh, that's difficult to always measure how much you can um, increase from where it was, although there are um, projects working on that as well, um, trying to measure how much these different uh, or this different management practices of the landowners and the biodiversity stewardship um, landowners, how much more water can be um, can be produced in the in this um, well managed ecosystems? For example, that's one example. Um, getting somebody to pay for these and how these benefits are distributed is a little more difficult. As I mentioned in my, my part of the presentation, the water in Gauteng um, come from, from this area. So in, in that regard, it is just distributed um, to a downstream site, but, but I mean, um, it's difficult to, to determine how, how exactly these benefits are distributed. Absolutely. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thanks, Karina. Carla, I don't know if you want to chip anything in there or if you're happy that Karina's covered it. No, other than it would be an excellent exercise to actually quantify the value of stewardship officers um, to really yeah, help people to appreciate the, the work that's being done. Um, 
you know, a lot of our provincial governing bodies are under staff or capacity constraint. And so we as NGOs are really trying to help them out. Um, uh, there's, you know, post-declaration support is essential. So, um, yeah, it's really important that we, we appreciate that. And, yeah, that could really help, you know, with funding and, and keeping these projects going. Absolutely. And, and as we said last week, the, getting the areas declared as biodiversity stewardship sites are just step one in a much bigger process. It's really finding out ways to bring benefits to these landowners in the long term and keep these areas sustainably conserved um, and also providing all of those ecological benefits, but also obviously return to those landowners that have committed to keeping these properties in conservation. I see we have gone through eight o'clock, so I don't want to keep everybody too late tonight, but I'd just like to say a big thank you to both of you for all of your hard work that you continue to do out there in the grasslands and the wetlands. And I hope that tonight has really inspired everybody to get out there and visit the incredible, amazing grasslands and wetlands that we have here in South Africa. And uh, certainly get in touch with Carl and Karina and find out a bit more about the birds in their areas and where you can see them. And we'd really, really encourage a, a visit to these amazing nature reserves that Kyle and Karina have the privilege of working on. So I'm gonna give each of you a chance just to uh, wrap up and say any last sentiments you'd like to share with our audience. And then I'll close us off for the night. So Kyle, we'll start off with you and then Karina. Other than just to say thank you for, for joining us and yeah, thank you for your continued support. Um, yeah, hopefully, We'll be able to share more with you in future conservation conversations as these projects uh, uh, happen or develop. So, yeah, uh, thank you. To, um, to just echo that, thank you so much for, for the opportunity to present our work to you. Um, and just a last thought on that benefits to the landowners. I've just had one of my landowners let me know that appeasement is the benefit to the landowner. So they are just happy to see the environment protected. Um, so yeah, thank you for all your support and I'm looking forward to seeing you. Fantastic. Thank you both. Thank you everyone for joining us for yet another Conservation Conversations episode. It's great to have all of you with us. Please do register for Virtual African Bird Fair. It's going to be an amazing event. And we will see you all on Tuesday for another biodiversity stewardship theme talk, but this time heading over to our coastal region, protecting those estuaries. So do join us then. And until then, keep your eyes on the skies, keep enjoying those birds, and I will see you same time, same place next week, Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Good night, everybody, and thank you for tuning in.